Okay, I'm going to drag the Bible back into this. And I'm actually going to read, read you something. Okay, this is from the 8th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning with the 14th verse. Now, you, you know it's going to be a good story because it's in Mark. And Mark never misses an opportunity to tell a dumb disciple story. So, here we go. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And they discussed this with one another and said, It's because we have no bread. <laughs> Aware of their discussion and rolling his eyes. No, it doesn't say that part. <laughs> Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketful of pieces did you pick up? Even though suspecting a trick question, they replied, 12? <laughs> and when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Now, they didn't know because it hadn't been written down yet, but just right before is when, in the same chapter, he had just broken the, the seven. But Jesus performs the miracle of multiplication, and then they get back in the boat, he has just uh, done the miracle of multiplication, and then as they want to do, the Pharisees are coming after him. And it's from there, they get in the boat, and he starts talking about beware the yeast of the Pharisees. Okay. For whatever reason, and you know, again, this is a wide old tradition that we have as Christians, we assume that Jesus is mad at us. And they say he's talking about yeast because I told you, Philip, you were supposed to get the bread. No, you were supposed to get the bread this week. So anyway, it's because we have no bread. But the Gospel of Mark says the disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Okay, and then Jesus talks about multiplying. When... You know, it's an interesting, because this, this is a great story about scarcity and abundance. It's a wonderful story about scarcity and abundance. And here are the observations I have. Questions. Let's put them in the form of questions. First off, why do we assume that Jesus is upset with us? Um, that's a very poor assumption. As you, as you may recall, he, he comes to die for us. He loves us. Okay, so that's the first bad assumption, and I, I just raised that because I think it's that assumption that helps fuel our sense of scarcity. This gets to the shame issue from this morning. Shame fears that there won't be enough love. The root of shame is the assumption that you, if you really knew me, wouldn't like me. Guilt fears getting caught. Shame fears being exposed as a person not worthy of love. So again, shame response. He's mad at us. Again, we did something dumb, but the assumption is he, 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 no, 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 he's mad at us. Okay, so that's first. Okay, so scarcity, the root of scarcity, in my opinion, again, is related to the shame response but the shame response is at the core of what it means to be a broken human being. Okay, we don't have time to go into all this, but that's, that's what I'm trying to do in a parallel manner with the money stuff. So, scarcity. Stuff is running out, we don't have enough, and we can't meet the demands of this God who won't get off our backs. That's the shame response. Now, the reality is something quite different. 
as I said, the reality is a God who actually loves us, a God who is coming for us, but he's coming for us to redeem us and to restore us and to help us in ways that we cannot help ourselves. That's the reality, but that's not our perception. Scarcity. Here's the thing. In the depths of our scarcity, when we start looking at our resources, it's because we have no bread. Interestingly enough, what we do have looks like even less than what we really do have. Did I say that well enough? What we, when we, when we, we've got a loaf, but when we start assuming scarcity, even what we have seems less than the reality. Okay. You and I, on the other hand, are invited into a life of abundance. Jesus says, I came to bring you life and to bring it to you, oh, every once in a while. Uh, no, I came to bring it to you abundantly. Okay. Material blessing, the material, the, the eternal one becomes material and all blessing now is found in him. Abundance. The, the issue is this, that whenever you and I as church focus solely on our own resources, it never appears that we have enough to do what it is we think God would have us do. Never. It's baked in the cake, as they say. It's, it's, it's a safe assumption. If you start looking only at what you have, it will never seem adequate to do what's necessary to do. Now, I'm saying all this in the light of all of this talk that Janet just led us through, and it's really crucial, and it's why we're here. But I'll tell you, I think about it myself, is when you just start looking at the numbers, it's really tempting to start thinking scarcity, right? And that's why, that's why I raise the thing, too. It's really tempting to just sort of stand there and think there is nothing we can do. Except the reality is this. There are resources. And they may not seem like enough, but Jesus is still in the boat with you. Now, that can just sound pious, but if you're a person of faith, you also know it to be true. It can be both kind of sounding pious and true. The remarkable thing is, of course, you know, we know the leaven, what that's all about. Be, fair, the, be, be worried about the influence of the Pharisees because, you know, you, they talk that way, but that has a way of, of permeating an entire conversation. You know, look at a church board. One person starts talking negatively, and before you know it, the whole thing. Okay, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. You may have a big pile of bread in the room, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. Okay, so anyway, resources. Beware the person who talks about scarcity. Because like the yeast of the Pharisees, that will permeate the room. Beware the, scarcity of the, beware the yeast of the Pharisees, on, particularly on scarcity, because that only can permeate the whole room, can permeate the whole church, can permeate an entire denomination, not naming any names. But it is possible. And the only answer to that is to stop looking only at what you have, because when you look at it, it looks like less than what you actually do have. But beyond that, remember who's in the boat with you. Remember, and he'll start asking you questions. What do you remember back? He may not refer you to the biblical miracles, but he might refer you to something in your own past. Do you remember the time when you fell in the blank? Or, as pastor, remind the church, do you remember the time when this church thought, fill in the blank? What happened? God did provide. So how do we now faithfully live in this day and age with Christ in the boat with us, being mindful that he's calling us to take steps, not about 25 years ago, or not about 25 years in the future, but steps here and now to address the issues in order to be faithful? That, friends, is the beginning of the movement away from a vision of scarcity to a vision of abundance. Because when you have a vision of abundance, you, you're still only looking at one loaf because somebody did forget to get the bread. But you're looking at that loaf through the eyes of Jesus, mindful of his power to multiply. We can take steps here and now, both in our own lives, personally, and as you'll hear more as, as the academy continues, in the lives of our congregation that slowly but surely begin to change our reality 
because first our vision is being changed. We're remembering. We're remembering what our call is. We're remembering what God insists on doing and asks us to participate in. Okay? Amen. All right? Okay. All right. Let's talk about giving. The whole point in, in Wesley's terms, as you may recall, that one is gaining all that one can without hurting yourself or others, and furthermore, one has set aside enough money to care for those who are dependent upon you, the whole point of that is to do what? You know this. Tell me. Give it away. The whole point is to move towards giving. Now, we can get in a conversation, and I've already kind of come forward saying I'm not sure that what Wesley was asking for, given um, different circumstances, is, is really possible. But that doesn't mean that we can't be taking steps towards more and more giving away. You know, I, I will tell you, first off, the, it's important to realize this, that if everybody, as, as Janet shared from the passing of the plate book, if everybody really was in the position where they were giving 10% of their income, I'll let them decide whether that's gross or net. I'll, I'll take net. I'm not fancy, not picky. I mean, we, we, we really would be, it'd be remarkable what we could be doing with that money. Okay. One thing you might want to ask, one thing we might want to ask ourselves as church is, would we actually be ready and willing to receive those amounts of resources? Would we be good stewards of those things should that money start a pouring in? Okay, so that's always a good question to be asking. So, but I, I, I'm willing to take a shot at it, <laughs> aren't you? So how does one then, um, if, but see, that's just it, is okay, say if everybody was doing that, wonderful. We could be doing remarkable things. It'd be great. We're already doing good things. We could be doing even more things. Wonderful. But why would we ever say that, okay, at such and such a point, okay, all, you're fine now. No reason to ever go beyond that. That's a really, really unmethodist way to think, you know. Yeah. Wesley never, Wes, you know, remember, Wesley says he expects to be made perfect in this love. In his examination of the many Methodists, he actually did encounter a number of people who he really did believe had achieved perfection in love according, remember your good Methodist terms, didn't mean you didn't make mistakes anymore, but all the, all the caveats around what that means. Wesley still anticipated, though, that even after death, this would continue. We could reach, in essence, a point in this life where we would be motivated only for the good of the other. And, and we, so, you know, we would never even think, it would never be a choice for us to put ourselves before the other. That's what Wesley's getting at. We could be so motivated that we had been made perfect in love. But that didn't mean that there won't be more things that come as time goes on or as time ends, you know, depending on how we look at that. So those things continue. So why would we ever say that when you've achieved this amount of giving, stop now. Don't do it anymore. We want to be making allowance. And, and again, I would say this for me on the use of money. One takeaway I really have is, am I committed as God provides as each year passes to be giving more away. Can I make that commitment? And again, not so wor much worry of, oh good, I've done, I've fulfilled my duty, but am I willing to be open as I see the abundance of God's work and I see God provide to be giving more, to be giving more? And I think that's, I know that's not, doesn't fulfill the letter of what Father John is asking, but at least it's a step in, in the direction. So that's what I want to say on that. Um, This is to remind us, and we've already had this conversation, and happy to talk a little bit about this. I've got some other things I want to talk about, but happy to talk a little bit about what I put before you. There you go. I wasn't making it up. There's the number. This is the change that is a coming. 340 point, you got to love the discipline, don't you? 340.2 point C, section 2, section C. That's getting way down there in the weeds. But this is the new language that will be in the 2016 edition of that little lovable book. To provide leadership for the funding ministry of the congregation to ensure membership care, including compliance with charitable giving documentation requirements and to provide appropriate pastoral care, the pastor in cooperation with the financial secretary shall have access to and responsibility for professional stewardship of congregational giving records. Now I gotta tell you, I don't know exactly what all that means. 
Well, yeah, I mean, it, it does mean that. I mean, does, does it mean now suddenly that, you know, the IRS could call me, you know, if... But now, the what, good thing about being in a church is, is we do have certain passes. We need to be able to, if somebody claims a gift, then we need to provide documentation for them. But the church has not the same stricture of requirements as would, an, as would another nonprofit, according to the IRS. We have, there's certain things that we get out on. But this... I would not choose to read this as if suddenly it's your job. You're not the compliance officer. I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose to read that way, although it, in one sense it kind of could sound that way. Again, yours is the pastoral job for what reasons? Why? I mean, it's not clear there. That's what it's going to say. But what? Tell me just a little bit about your conversations, if you can remember that far back. Why should we care why people give? Why should we know why people give? Get, kind of come back at me. What? Key to their heart and their passion. Key to their heart and their passion. Discipleship. Discipleship. Leadership. Leadership, okay. You want to keep the church doors open. <laughs> You'd like to, like to see the organization continue. Okay. Again, how many of you all, all uh, let me ask the question correctly this time. You know, you know what people give, and the church knows that you know what people give. Did you raise your hands? Okay, that's good. I mean, this has been changing over time, and I think the, the, I, my assumption is that the pastors who have been at this a while can say, there once was a time that you were in a very small minority if you knew. And again, I'm not talking about you, you sneak into the office at night. Um, that it just it wasn't done, and that's that whole privacy, individualism stuff, I think. Um, if traditionally you have not known, I, for what it's worth, I would say I do think it's good for you to know. I didn't know. I mean, you know some things, even without sitting down with the records, you do know some things because some folks like to tell you. Of course, some folks like to tell you, and they're lying. <laughs> uh, they like to create the illusion, or maybe they think that they really are the best givers in the church because they have not a clue as to what really a significant gift is. And I don't mean that they're outside of the means, is that they're just so kind of cheap that they think by really giving a, you know, $200 a year, wow, good job. Um, so if you don't know, I would really encourage you to invite a conversation. There's been a disciplinary change. Here's why I think it's a good idea if I do know. Discipleship, pastoral care, encouraging people to give all they can. Good Methodist reasons. And see where that goes. I do not advise anyone, I don't, you wouldn't be in this um, room if you were of this mindset, to simply go and announce to the folks, <coughs> give me them records. Discipline says I can have them. Give me them. You're going to have about as much success with that that's saying, we've been apportioned X amount, therefore pay up, chump. And no one's going to ever ask a question about that. So I would encourage you to be very careful because you're talking about a very deep, profound cultural change in some settings. But I really think now it's important for you to know, primarily for pastoral reasons, which are spelled out here. So let me pause there for a moment. Any questions, thoughts, any push back on that or want to uh, say anything more? Yes? I made the mistake one time of making somebody um, finance chair before looking at his giving. Right. And um, he was a CFO and I thought I was getting technical expertise and instead uh, I got so, a grumpy old man who <laughs> Mm -hmm. for Christ and uh, was um, really caused a lot of strife. So when you're, when you're looking for you know, people to fill out those positions uh, in leadership, uh, especially, make sure they're solid givers. I mean, you, and you know what I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, again, someone can push back and say, well, this sounds like the book of James. You're favoring the wealthy. No, I'm not favoring the wealthy. I'm favoring the givers. 
we, we want in leadership people whose hearts are being changed and who understand that generosity really for a Christian is not an option. It's supposed to be one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's supposed to be something that God is doing in us as we allow God to work in our lives. How do we know that when we don't actually know what their needs I know. are exactly? Yeah, yeah, I know that's a good question. Well, you're, you're kind of you're, you're kind of guessing things. So, I mean, you know, percentage-wise, on, on average, the, the less wealthy folks tend to be always better percentage givers. Yep. You have, you know, <laughs> here, here's the bad news. Okay, insofar as the average United Methodist Church is a thoroughly middle-class organization, this is the bad news. As far as a percentage of, of, of wealth, of income, poor folks give a high percentage. Then you have a significant drop-off. This is the grand average, 2.5%. Two, two those are our people. <laughs> those, those are our folks. And then the very wealthy, you start to see an uptick again as a percentage of what they have. Like, you know, Buffett promising all of his money pretty much given away. So, again, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, should, you know, who should be giving the most. We're not what we're talking about. I'm just talking about on average. And like I said, the bad news is your average United Methodist occupies that, you know, it makes sense. This is culturally, this is the land of struggle. This is the trying to get ahead. This is trying to get the, the, the Buick instead of the Chevy. This is the, this is the, the land of America in which most of us, many of us live. Now, there's plenty of folks who don't live there either, but the average United Methodist is in that middle class. And ha since they're not following Janet's uh, uh, talk about how much discretionary income, and certainly they don't see giving to the church as a fixed, uh, uh, as something fixed. So what that means is, on average, well, let me say a word about average in a minute, but on average, eh, two and a half percent, because that's really all I can afford, because I've done all this other stuff. Okay. Average, you know, we, we use this term, it's pretty much meaningless, however. So really, now again, once you know the giving records, there's just a little more advice, and you want to then think, okay, here's what we give, here's how they give, do some planning, you will quickly see once again, something we've already talked about, that the average gift is meaningless because you have so many folks who give pretty much nothing and you got a handful of folks who give, the 15% give 85%. So you average that out, who cares? <laughs> what you really should be looking for is the median gift. If you wanna, if you wanna raise something up as here's, if you're, if you're think, getting, trying to get more serious, you wanna be a more generous person, at least start aiming here. Okay, because then what's the average point? That gives you, the, that's a better assessment of the actual giving health of the congregation. Okay, here's, not average them all together, but here's kind of the midpoint gift, as many, as many below as above. Okay, that's, that's a good place to start and look at. All right. You said that we should let the congregation know that we have access to this information. How would you recommend that we do that? Um... Well, I, I would, here, here's, here's what I do. Even though the discipline says you shall, I would ask permission. I would say, as your pastor, I, I want to I recognize the fact this is a new thing. But I wanna, here's the reasons why I think it's important for me to know, are you willing to share those things with me? Now, again, this, don't, you I mean, pray a lot before you do this, because you, you will get some interesting responses to that. But I would, I'd start there. I'd talk to the administrative council. I talk to your leadership, say, I want to know this. And, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure the word will get out. I don't think I'd have to make an announcement from the pulpit. But I would let my leadership know and just say, starting here. And, and just say, as the pastor, just like if somebody was having some difficulty in their life, this dies with me. I'm not telling anyone else. But I may talk to you about your giving. Okay. Um, but... They would need to understand that this, this is where this, the church wants me to assume this as a part of my pastoral relationship with you, which in many, many ways is a very confidential relationship. So I would, I would I'd, I'd get it known, I want to do this, here's the reasons why, and then see where you go from there. I want, I'd also make sure your DS knew that you're about to have this conversation. I've, I've kind of gotten it out there, um, we've got at least one DS in the room. I, um, I, I've, I've, I've made it known to my bishop and to the cabinet, listen, if, you're, if you want me to, I'm happy to kind of talk to some pastors about how the best way is to broach this. 
what I'm afraid of, and again, this is not you folks, because you wouldn't be doing this if you rolled this way. I am afraid of folks just going in saying, give me those records, and watch the mayhem ensue. This, by the way, this was passed as a part of uh, 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 the consent calendar. It was, it, this, this passed, actually I wrote it down. Uh, the, the vote was 761 to 21. Thanks be to God, the unity has been restored to the United Methodist Church. 761 to 21. So that does mean that nobody knew it was in there. So, um, yes, sir. Oh. Oh yeah. I think there's some congregation to ask for permission from them um, might work. But there's some okay. others okay. that that same conversation would be handled a lot differently. I hear that. All right. Okay. Okay. Do you want to give an example? You wanna give a contrast there? On <laughs> Yeah, okay. Okay. And in order for us to be able, or for me as pastor, to evaluate that, we have to have some things that we can do to get some indication of that, especially in the financial arena. Right. Because we do that every Sunday. Uh, so, so a conversation like that, not necessarily asking permission, but as I'm the pastor and these are some of the leaders, and we're trying to make sure we are holding people accountable. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 I know. I know. We don't require a whole lot. Right. Okay. So right. It's kind of how do you do the ask? And I think you have to know the culture. Yes. In order to get the right ask. I agree. I agree. I. 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 I point. Point well taken. I, I agree. I. I would. I'd say this too. Is as a part of that conversation, I would say I want everybody around this table. Now again, you get this may inhibit your own asking for permission or not permission, but your own engaging the conversation. Here's what I give. I want you to know that. And you maybe even said, I, I, I'm a part of this great new academy sponsored by the foundation, and we heard this talk about we got to get past our inability to talk about money in the church. So I'm going to go first. Here's what I give. And I, you might even say, listen, um, I want to do better than that. Or you could also say, too, is, you know, I want to do better than that, and I also realize that I'm probably in the top 2% of givers in this church even though I'm probably in the top or in the, in the maybe bot, whatever, middle ground, well middle ground of earners in this church. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I want to do better, and I want you to hold me accountable. Yeah. And as you said that, as you said that, um, yeah, with the finance man, that's why I started with the finance man, having conversations. Yeah. So, Y'all count the money. Y'all know what I get. Right, right. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I um, let me just say, a, go ahead. Yeah, um, he'll be here. Is he here the next time? Cliff Christopher has probably played as large a role in this as anybody in our denomination of, um, you know, and not your parents' offering plate where he talks about it. The, the point I'd push back on Cliff is um, I'd, I'd want to put the emphasis and focus on the pastoral relationship. And again, not a matter of leadership, but rather than the CEO of a nonprofit. I guess you could describe yourself that way. I'm not sure how descriptive that is actually, though, of what you do. Um, so that would be the one little nitpick I'd have there. But I, I definitely think there are, you have reasons to know why people give that a CEO of a nonprofit couldn't care less about. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they should care because everybody should be encouraging generosity. But you have a, as you well know, you have a particular, let us say, peculiar role in the lives of human beings. 
And that means the, knowing what a person gives fits a, a very strange, unusual function. The Lord has asked you to look over them and to watch over them and care for them. And that's going to create just an entirely different set of rationales for your relationship than anyone else would have. That's, that's one guy's opinion. <coughs> Go ahead. When you were talking about the assumption of confidentiality, of this type of thing, it just struck me that there may not be any trust in that. Right. And that our churches are often so much places of gossip. Right. And I think about the prayer list and the conversation yeah. about prayer chains. how so-and-so doing yeah. just gets repeated over and over and over. Yeah. And so we don't practice confidentiality. No. And we don't practice boundaries right. in other areas, right. in some areas. Right. We practice absolute secrecy in this area. Yeah. Well, so we're undisciplined yeah. In yeah. Well, you know, one conversation leads to another. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's an okay thing to talk about, too. Tell your DS first, though, before you start talking about the prayer chain. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, should we put our concern for the finance chair's generosity on the prayer list? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a HIPAA violation. <laughs> I, I, just, I just put a cartoon on Facebook. It, it, it's, it's the pastor. He's up front. He's all got his robes on. And he said, uh, I understand that some of you have been uh, critical of me that my sermons are too intellectual. Therefore, I want to vo- invite the following people up for the children's sermon. <laughs> I don't recommend that. Um, but... That's my response to that. Um, yeah. the, you know, the, again, the, we, we, began, we began this morning with, with the transformation of the imagination, the, the turning of our thinking, and, and, and this is an important turn of the thinking, is this is not snooping, this is not sticking your nose where it doesn't belong. This is trying to understand where a person is in their life on one of the key indicators, how generous I am. There is, um, you know, uh, Jan mentioned this morning, passing the plate, Chris Smith. Chris Smith uh, teaches sociology at Notre Dame. He um, has actually runs an institute on generosity at Notre Dame. So his last book, the last book is, well, he publishes a lot. He publishes, you know, it's one of these guys, publishes more books than you read. But I think one of the last books that he published is called The Paradox of Generosity. I highly recommend it. He actually, you know, again, as she said, for a sociologist, he really writes well. And the topic is something that you'll find fascinating, I'm certain. So what, what, what Smith is, is uh, studying these days are, is looking at the lives of generous people, and he looks at various indicators. He has, picks out about five or six different indications that spell the, out a generous life. And one of them is he uses, as, as for, for financial giving, he uses 10% as a benchmark. Okay. Uh, he talks about the volunteering of time. He talks about uh, how much time you have for your neighbors. He talks about how much time you have for your family. So he, he looks at these various ways to indicate how willing we are to share our lives with others. Okay. And, you know, I... I it, I've heard for many years since we've been doing this in particular that um, and it didn't happen here, but there's always somebody who wants to change the subject once we start talking about money and giving of it. And, and it usually goes along these lines. Well, how about the people, that is meaning me, who they don't give so much money to the church, but they volunteer their time? What, and, and I, depending on how much sleep I had the night before, I, I, I say something along the lines of, valid point, um, but we're talking about money right now. <laughs> We can talk about that some other time, because that so often is a way to, hey, uh, this is making me uncomfortable, I want to talk about this. But here's what Smith would say to that, is it turns out, and you can, uh, my hunch is, you would see this as you examine the giving records, that more often than not, it's the very same people who are giving financially who are also volunteering their time. Absolutely. Generous people are generous in multi-dimensions. Okay. This is a good reason why, uh, add for planned giving once you get to it, you don't need to be afraid to ask generous givers to make a planned gift on top of it. They're not going to cut back in one area in order to fund something else because that's just not the way they roll. It doesn't seem natural. There's another indicator too is that generous people 
they are, they're reflective of their giving, whether it's time, presence, money, but not in a kind of a boastful, aren't I good or better than, it's of a, man, does it feel good to give? To the degree they're reflective on it, it's a sense of, I love to give. It, 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 it just feels right. It wouldn't, it, they, they would be angry with you if you said, no, don't do it anymore. They would feel inhibited because they've passed through and discovered something. So Smith also realizes, too, is that generosity is a, is a set of practices which over time becomes a character trait. Okay? Now, this is good Methodist stuff. As we do some stuff, we start doing it, it hurts, it's painful, like, like fixing a budget and, and abiding by it. No fun. But over time, you inhabit it long enough, it becomes natural, and you can't quite imagine you would not want to any longer live not knowing where the money is going. Okay? But particularly for something like generosity, is both, as I said, a set of practices and attitudes that deeply becomes a part of who you are. Sounds to me like the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and we know that. Why? Because generosity, goodness, one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's the, get to your again. It's the paradox of generosity because the subtitle is this. He's a, Smith's a Christian, Catholic, believe, strong Catholic Christian. Why is it that the life given away is the only life discovered? I'm paraphrasing it, but that's, he's, he, he's quoting the text. How is it that those who seek to save their lives lose them? It's a great book. I wish I was smart enough to write a book like that. It's a wonderful book. Okay. So anyway, um, go ahead, back here. Right. Now the NRSV says generosity. Right. Same word, same Greek word either, for either way. But, but the Greek word, when you look at it, is action-oriented and it's translated benevolence. Right. It's not being good, it's doing good. Yeah, right. Do trans- that really goes with what practice is. Yeah, exactly, exactly, right, right. So you are doing good enough that it actually becomes, becomes good. Character. It becomes who you are, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so here, here's the pitch. This is my big pitch. I'll go get to you in a second. Again, if, if one takeaway from today, if, if this could be one of them, I, I wish this could be. We, you know, we're fallen, and, you know, we've got a bunch of different motivating factors in our lives. Um, so I, I, I accept that. I know that. I know that about my own life. But I also know this, given this conversation we've just been having, you need never feel ashamed, or you need never feel that you're impinging upon somebody by asking them to be generous. Never. Now again, you may may be working your own angles, but then you gotta figure that one out for yourself. But just in the course of your vocation, you need never feel that in some way or other, when you are encouraging and, and, and challenging people to give, that this is in any way anything other than trying to inhabit the mainstream of what Christ has called you to do. See, financial ministry isn't, like I said this morning, isn't something we hold our nose in order to get to the good stuff. It's a deep and profound part of the main thing the Lord has asked you to do. Okay? I, 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 I'm, I'm really trying to get more clear in how I say that because I, I've tended to mumble that. But I'm, as, I, as I get older and the, the brakes start to fail, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that is said clearly and without hesitation. You need never feel bad for pressing the folks to not be satisfied with just throwing a few bucks in here and there. Challenge, two, two, two I think two fairly, there's nothing safe with this, let's say, say that, but, but two, I think, good ways to, to get at this conversation in that challenge is to say, I trust that God will help you know. This is the kind of thing God wants you to know, is what you should be giving. I really do believe if you honestly pray, God will help you know that. It's not so much for me to assign you a number. I want you to be thinking and ask God what what God would have you do. And just keep challenging. Just keep doing that. Say it with a smile. Say it with love. But keep pressing. And you will get some bad reactions. No doubt about it. But where God is working, you'll see some wonderful things, too. You had a question back here? Well, I was just going to say, too, for a biblical example of a pastor actually knowing people are giving, but Paul, Paul indicated several times he knew exactly what churches were giving 
Oh, yeah. Right, were. right. Um, and it was clear to Ananias and Sapphira that they knew when they lied how much they sold their house for and how much they actually put in the plate. Yeah. So that financial accountability is biblical. It's not a modern thing where we're superimposing on top of it. Exactly. It's a biblical standard. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and preach Ananias and Sapphira at least once a month. <laughs> <laughs> but tell your DS first. <laughs> Let's hear from a DS. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, for allowing them, uh, making way for right. them to be generous and to be a blessing. Right, right. The, 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 point she was ma- the point she made, in case you didn't hear, was that um, insofar as we were talking about a means of grace here, and we should, know, we should be no more hesitant in challenging people to give as we would be to challenge them to read the Bible, to present themselves for communion, to pray. We're talking very much the same thing, transformational kind of witness. You, you mentioned the prisoners. I, I had a, a former student um, at the seminary who, she's, she's not appointed there now, but at the time um, when she was appointed, she was the first pastor, the organizing pastor of um, a woman at the well, United Methodist Church. It was an unusual church in that um, every member was a woman. The reason every member was a woman because the church was in the Iowa Correctional Facility for uh, women. It was a prison. Church was in the prison. And uh, Arnett, the, the pastor at the time, um, she, I had her come back to talk to the seminary students uh, once. And just, you know, I, I, I can't begin to tell you the wonderful stories coming out of this. Uh, things like um, they, the women were not allowed to have any physical contact with each other. That was a rule. You can't, can't touch each other. Arnett got permission that they could hug each other during the passing of the peace. Now, can you imagine what a passing of the peace that would be? <laughs> this is the only time you actually have any, phys- legally, have any physical contact with another human being. Wow, you talk about that. I, I bet some good things were happening then. Yeah, yeah. So in how much that meant, that kind of, talk about a real, you know, restoration of relationships. Okay, that's one thing. But this is the thing I wanted to tell you. Arnett, the, the women had to uh, perform some duties within the, ch- within the prison and for that, they were paid uh, 25 cents an hour. When they were organizing the church, Arnett had not even brought up any idea of taking up an offering. They insisted. And here's why they said it. Give me a second. This, this gets to me. This is just great stuff. No, we want to be a real church, and real Christians give. I encourage you to take that story back to your own church and talk about that. 25 cents an hour, but they insisted that an offering had to be taken up because they didn't want to be a play church. They wanted to be a real church. Real Christians give. It's just what it means. It's natural. How can you not give? Okay. Well, it turns out you can. (laughs) And uh, just real fast. No, I don't have time for that. I'm not going to do that. Um, we're going to, I'm going to, we're going to get these PowerPoints to, um, Andy, at least the PDFs. We'll get the PDFs. We'll, you'll get, you'll get, uh, copies of all this. L- let me, let me say this, um, that we have various motivations for giving. What we really want to encourage, uh, and that, so there, basically there's, and this, this is in the book. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in that book, really. Um, we tend, uh, another, another uh, study shows that Christians tend to give to their church for four basic reasons. One of which is not good. That's the first one, reciprocity with God. It, it, this is kind of um, akin to um, prosperity gospel. This is, God has done something for me. I want to pay God back. You know, it's natural. If somebody does something nice for you, you want to return the favor. Not a bad thing. It gets perverted when it's, I go first and I'm going to make God give me something. 
then that's a bad thing. But the problem with that is God gives and just gives and is not really primarily interested in our response to that. He's not, he's not looking, hey, I did that. Don't forget I did that for you. Come on. Um, so reciprocity with, 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 with God. Second reason people give in the church is reciprocity with other Christians. Mm-hmm. Kind of keeping up with the Joneses. This is the problem, particularly if you start talking about an average gift. Well, for most of us, average is just fine. <laughs> so you're, you're appealing to a fairly acceptable standard and, and, and motivation for doing anything is do your fair share. Nothing more required of you than, you know, and you, and we do this innocently in so many ways. If everybody in this room gave X, then we could do such and such. Okay, well, that's, that's good. That would get one thing done, but you're, you're kind of falling short of really motivating a person in accordance with what we assume God is doing in their lives. The third re- reason why people give, we give as a, an extension of ourselves. How many of you ever have, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a leap of faith here and assume that if, as, as you went to college or in seminary, every once in a while, they try to check up with you. And it's purely from the goodness of their hearts, but they send you a letter that, by the way, happens to have some kind of pledge card in it. Okay? Now, unless you are a person of significant means, you do not get fundraising letters from organizations with which you are not associated. That is your own alma maters. They, they ask you. They come approaching you. Why? because they're, they're assuming that you associate and you see the school now as a part of who you are. And we are motivated to support those things that we identify with. Okay? So, there's a reason why I give to this church. There's a reason why I come to this church, because my grandfather did such and such here. There's a reason why you can never take me off the rolls of the church, even though I've not been there in 20 years. It's because my family used to be there. I associate myself with that. Okay. It explains a lot of the reasons why a lot of the gifts that come to churches come to them. The final reason, and this is what we're really trying to encourage, is gratitude. Not payback, but the simple, pure acknowledgement that while we were yet sinners, God loved us. That while we didn't want to have anything to do with God, God wanted to have everything to do with us. And the only thing you can say to that is thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And one of the ways that we can say thank you is we begin to care more and more about the things of God and particularly the folks that Jesus really does love. And we care for the poor especially. That's an act of gratitude. I am not paying anything back. There's nothing to be repaid. This was a gift to me. But what I am trying to do is live a life that acknowledges the gift that's been given to me. That's what we want to challenge people and more and more to allow that to become what they think about as they're giving, or what they think about as they're contemplating a gift. How do we challenge that? Okay. Finally. Can I have one question? Yeah, go ahead. Now, this is a situation, it's not hypothetical, but if you look in the records and you find that, you know, some of the people who seem to uh, critique or complain a lot keep zero. Yeah. Well, um, there's, of course, any number of things you could do. Um, I had, Which do I have to tell the Yeah, I, I, had an, I had another student, uh, uh, and uh, he was a student pastor and, from Northern Illinois Annual Conference, and uh, they had been pushing this. This is going on 10 years ago now. They'd been pressing this whole thing about pastors need to know. So this fellow looked into the records, and he discovered exactly what you're saying is this person who was giving him grief all the time wasn't giving. And I remember him calling me up and saying, so I guess I don't have to listen to him anymore, do I? I said, well, you know, that's probably not the most pastoral response. Um, I, I, well, again, I think, you can, I think you can come back to that in a number of ways. One, you can challenge that person who is so critical that let's, let's focus a little more on what we can give rather than what we can take. And, um, and then... In part, there's a little bit of freedom for you in that. I don't, you know, I don't think 
see, if, if we start changing, we become guilty of what James is warning us about. If we start changing the way we treat people according to now knowing the giving records, then I think, then you got the epistle of James to deal with. But from a leadership position and trying to find, a, as, as somebody shared back here, not putting people who are stingy, not giving them the responsibility of encouraging generosity in others. From a leadership standpoint, that's exactly right to do. That's not discounting them as human beings or, or refusing to deal with them as human beings. But I'm not, we're not going to promote that. We don't, again, the yeast of the fairy. We don't want that permeating the church. So um, I think you can do more than one thing, but I think you do say, okay, well, um, I appreciate that, but I'm not going to let that really affect how I think. I can continue to offer care to that person, but I'm not going to take them seriously when they're obviously unwilling to really commit themselves in this way. And my hunch is, you know, very, you know it's, it's the opposite way to this book, The, par the uh, Paradox of Generosity. He also tells stories. It's amazing what folks will share with people. He also interviews ungenerous people. And oh, Lordy, by the time you're done with that book, you do not want to be ungenerous. I mean, it's really, it's tragic, just kind of heartbreaking, the small, closed-in lives that they talk about freely, have no idea how, how, far below their, how far below they're living what they could be. It's really, really kind of harrowing. Yeah, do you have something? Yeah, sure. I mean, the finances are a diagnostic tool for the right. person's soul. Right. They say it's a diagnostic tool for the right. soul. And so our job becomes to pass them and figure out what's happening, what is, where's the heartbreak, where's the brokenness right. that we need to address. Right. Where it becomes more confusing is that they're giving generously and speaking ungenerously. Right. Or if they're, yeah. speaking, if they're speaking generously but not giving, yeah. then there's an inconsistency there, and that's even harder to diagnose. But right. the person's consistent and speaking to you, you get a pretty good idea where they're standing. Yeah, yeah. And, and regardless, it becomes a conversation. Yeah. Eight Exactly, exactly. And, you know, and like I said, I mean, diagnostically, it turns out that as, even as generous people tend to be generous in multi-dimensions, ungenerous people tend to be the same way. Yep. You don't tend to hold back here, and you're just, you're just overflowing with goodness in other ways. Um, so that's, that turns to be the case. Let me, let me close with this. Um, a number of years ago, uh, um, I had opportunity to work with some Korean Methodist pastors. Mm. And... Um, they, uh, and you know, if, you, if you've traveled to Asia or, or, or worked with, with folks from time to time, one, one thing that is a little, is a cultural difference, at least that I saw and noticed, and I've heard other people say the same thing, is uh, the Korean people, when they would hand me something, they used two hands to give it to me, regardless of how small it was. And this is really pronounced if you exchange business cards. Again, how heavy is that? Yeah. So the business card. I didn't, I didn't ask because, you know, I'm the same guy I didn't ask, what does the numbers with the parentheses around them mean? I, I'll, 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 look, I'll Google that. I'll look that up later. Um, but I heard somebody say, too, in sharing this story that uh, he did ask. Uh, he, he, this, this is a guy who was at Princeton, and there were a number of Korean students in the same uh, apartment complex that he lived. So he asked a friend, why do you do that? I mean, what's that all about? He said, well, at least this is what he had heard. In our culture, when we give a gift... We use both hands because it means we are holding nothing back. We are giving it away completely. It is now yours, not mine. Okay. And I thought, wow, that's really pretty good. That's pretty good. Because I think what you see revealed in that, a couple things. Um, I think my, my temptation or my tendency would be not to give like this, but to give more like, hmm, Eh, that's a bit much, like that. But I got, but I, I still got some. So I got some. I got enough to get back to Nashville. No, I got, got some here. Okay. So, that's the temptation: is that not to give with both hands, let it go completely. Here, it's yours. But to give half-heartedly. But the other thing is, and this is my own thinking about this too, is. Well, you know, it really is pretty neat, and this goes beyond Korean culture or Asian culture. This should be Christian culture. <clears throat> the reason why you and I as Christians should give with both hands, because it turns out when God gives, God gives two-handedly. And how do we know that? Because we have a representation of that in the front of every last one of our churches. When God gives God's self, 
it's given, he's given completely. Nothing's held back. It's all left. So, that's the same God who rose from the dead and who's in the boat with you, and it wants you to think in terms of the abundance that he offers rather than the scarcity that we're tempted to see. Amen? Amen. All right. Andy?